And hello, everybody. Welcome to Tuesday Night's Narrative Live. It's good to be with you tonight. We're doing something very different for this show. We're going to look at the Durham trial, the investigation and uh, trial of, of uh, Michael Sussman, which is fascinating and interesting, and you'll love it. Uh, stay with us. Don't, don't run away on that one. And here's uh, Chris Vickery, our special guest tonight. How are you, Chris? It's been a while since we've spoken to you. How are you doing? Yeah, yeah, it's been a while. I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing okay. It's good to hear uh, you are now the risk of senior risk assessment specialist um, at your current job. Um, and uh, do you want to tell us who that is, or should we just move beyond that name? I don't know if you, if you want us to share the name. I, I work for one of the major cloud storage providers these days okay. and on the uh, security team. They are very lucky to have you because as many people know, back in, was it 2016 or was it before 2016? Um, you were one of the key whistleblowers on what was going on online in terms of the use of data and, and misinformation and disinformation especially on social media mid, mid 2015 that yeah. I, I started kind of making a, a name for myself in that in that realm yeah so you're familiar with the the realm of you know reporting all sorts of data information to various authorities whether they be uh, in congress or or the fbi whomever else might investigate these things this is not unusual territory for you yeah, and uh, I'm I'm both familiar with the the side of me bringing things to their attention that need to be brought to their attention, as well as them requesting information from me related to things that I have found that they are interested in hearing more about. Yes. Yeah, and you're not on on, on trial today. You you haven't done anything that's ever got you to this point of uh, of Mr. Sussman over here where he's on trial um, in this nope. major major investigation. So, uh, you know, you might, you might have insights into why he might be on trial and. And you're not. <laughs> yeah, so, I, I mean, there were there were plenty of situations where I definitely, if if I had acted differently, I think I could be in the same shoes as him. But I've been very careful to always be forthcoming, honest, transparent. When you're talking to federal investigators or a government committee or, or anybody of that layer, you don't spin things, you don't sugarcoat things, you tell it like it is. You are honest. You don't lie. That's yeah, don't the important lie thing. to the Do FBI. It rhymes. Yeah, don't um, so. let the FBI. That's like rule number one. Yeah, <laughs> because they will find out. I mean, they just have the capability of discovering all these things. And and as it turns out, the allegation against Mr. Sussman is that he did lie to them specifically about who his employers were at the time of him selling the FBI the story about this Alpha Bank server. Um, and his employer at the time was the Clinton campaign. And this is where everyone gets like, oh my gosh, you know, are we saying anything bad about the Clinton campaign? We don't know yet the complete involvement about the Clinton campaign. And we don't even know if this was a full crime because no one's been found guilty yet. But, you know, there's a possibility that some people around the Clinton campaign were involved in some dirty tricks in typical political stuff. This is not that unusual for there to be politicking and dirty tricks going on. What's unusual is what they did or what they're alleged to have done. And we're going to go through that in great detail tonight. But we should also cover the other parts of the news, which I didn't even tell you we were going to do. So I hope you don't mind uh, <laughs> as we step into this. And I hope uh, Eric Garland, who will join us from somewhere, uh, he's on the road. So we'll hopefully he'll get to us uh, while he's on the road because he's got a lot of this information that we need to get a hold of tonight. But, in, but let me just uh, bring everyone up to speed about what happened today with uh, the investigation into January the 6th because the big news came out of the New York Times. And uh, they are reporting that the Department of Justice is now fully engaged in wanting the transcripts from the January 6th committee. So um, that is a pretty big deal. I'm going to just pull up the, the latest story. Could you hear any of that? You couldn't hear any of that, could you? You couldn't. Now you can hear. I, I can't hear the the video while while it's split on something else like that. No, I can only yeah, see. You that. now can hear me, which is good. I think no, you can hear me, yeah, right? No, okay, so we'll we'll do that again because it was so good the first time. Um, this is the main article that came in the New York Times earlier on today, and it is the big breaking news. The Justice Department requests transcripts from the January sixth committee. The committee has interviewed more than one thousand people, and the transcripts could be used as evidence in potential criminal cases or to pursue new leads. The article itself goes on to say the Justice Department has asked um, uh, the January 6th committee 
let me just pull this up in the form that I can read it. Sorry, here I've got a much bigger screen available to me. Um, uh, the Justice Department has asked the House Committee investigating the January 6th attack for transcripts of interviews it is conducting, which have included discussions with associates of former President Donald J. Trump, according to people with knowledge of the situation. The move, coming as Attorney General Merrick, R. G uh, Merrick B. Garland, uh, appears to be ramping up the pace of painstaking investigation into the Capitol riot, the clearest sign yet of a wide-ranging inquiry at the Justice Department. The House Committee has interviewed more than 1,000 people so far, and the transcripts could be used as evidence in potential criminal cases. So we've known, we've all expected this, we've sort of all hoped that this is going to be the case, but this is a real sign now that the Department of Justice is actually you know, considering criminal cases around those key people, the key, you know, handful, but maybe even much larger group of people uh, around Donald Trump who put together January the 6th. And you're, you're a political observer as much as you are a, a, a data observer. Um, do you have any thoughts about this, Chris? Well, it, it makes perfect sense because it would be a crime to lie to the January 6th committee. Uh, you don't you don't even have to be be sworn in or, or, you know, swear an oath or anything. It simply is a crime to lie to them. So it's great fodder for uh, an investigatory body like the FBI to then use that material, because if somebody lied in that stuff, it, it, it's it, it creates all sorts of, of problems. So it has some initial uh weight to it no matter what they said if it's on a transcript in front of a, a congressional committee it is something that you can take seriously as an investigative body because they're not allowed to throw spin at you through that means so it's right. it's very very good for starting investigations not necessarily for uh uh you got to be very careful on the political side of things and that they're already seeing in this trial with sussman uh, you got to take things for the facts that they are and starting off with a foundation of this has to be true. Otherwise, they were lying to a congressional committee is a very good way to start investigations mm. as well as bolster existing ones. And we've got to remember that uh, Representative Raskin said that there were additional new crimes that they had uncovered in their investigation, which no one knows about yet. And so there's probably you know a few. He said it was in the plural. Uh, and I know of a couple, in fact, that might be bubbling under in that in that committee that look like really serious crimes. These are really important, you know, things that you would not want out there involving those key people. These are, you know, I'll just put up the slide because I, I proudly only put, made the slide on January the 7th or something like that, uh, the day after the insurrection. And this is my theory about who, who it was that was doing what on January the 6th. And so, you know, Roger Stone was the guy who raised the militia and brought in the, the Proud Boys and, and maybe also the uh, Oath Keepers. Alex Jones certainly ran the propaganda on this thing. Michael Flynn built the, the digital army and the intelligence operation with Q. You had Rudy and Sidney Powell doing the, uh, you know, this uh, fraud um, legal campaign that they were trying to push through, the Stop the Steal campaign. campaign. And then you've got uh, Bannon as well. Steve Bannon is not on here. He was the key um, protagonist here. He was a key designer of this whole event. You've got, um, these are pretty uh, big, bold names, bold, bold face names in the Trump world. They all... Have been have they all been pardoned? They've sort of most of uh, Flynn and Stone have been pardoned, and so there's a potential there that they they have you know they can turn evidence against Donald Trump, and they'll probably be asked to if they if the investigators feel that there's enough evidence. So um, that could be interesting. It could go all the way up to Donald Trump. Is I guess what I'm saying. It's not just this inner circle, and it's not just the organizers, and it's not. It could go all the way to the president of the United States for being part of this seditious conspiracy. Because what else was he doing? for seven and a half hours, you know? What else was he, do? like, do you, he must have known in all the planning meetings, in all the, um, you know, in, in knowing that the Oath Keepers were gonna be there, the Proud Boys were gonna be there, in knowing that the Moonies were gonna be there, in knowing that the speeches were gonna be said the way they were, um, in knowing that the Pentagon had, stemped, had stood down all its uh, National Guard, um, or at least the, the, uh, the uh, riot control gear of the National Guard, all of that, is an indicator he must have known because who, who else would have issued those orders? He's the only one who could have issued those orders to people like um, like Chris Miller at the Pentagon and likewise. So I I think I'm hopeful, as many people have been saying for a long time, that um, that the, Mary Garland isn't in fact a fraud and he will in fact uh, do his job as the Attorney General and will prosecute, even though it's taking him a longer longer time than people had wanted. We are now in sort of the heat of things as we turn into May and June with the January the 6th hearings taking place next month. Now is the time where Mary Garland really has an opportunity to use that public um, space as, the, as everyone is discussing January the 6th to press forward with some 
um, um, actual indictments against some of the leadership there. That's my hopeful spin. I hope it actually happens, but we'll see. Um, I won't push you on any more of this stuff because I know it's not your. So why we asked you here? So we'll we'll, we'll move on, <laughs> and you know it's it's tough to put someone on the spot on something like this. So I'm going to move on and talk a little bit more about the Michael Sussman trial. And now, are you are you familiar enough to describe to people exactly what he's been um, accused of? Do you know what his actual um, indictment or criminal act was that he's doing or accused of doing? I, I believe I do. Uh, there's so much confusion about this thing that, uh, you know, please, please feel free to, to correct me if you believe it's something different than my understanding. Uh, the, the mistake that I feel that uh, the, the media is, is getting into when they describe this is they're making it all about politics. That's not the element of the crime he is accused of. He's accused of lying to the FBI when he said that he was bringing material forward to them about uh, potential national security matters, and he was not doing it in combination with work for any client. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem because, and I'm looking at the indictment on the other screen here uh, next to the one I'm talking to you on, it's important because he billed on his uh, attorney billing system with the, the law firm he was with, he billed the uh, political campaign that was his client at the time <laughs> for dealing with that material and the FBI and meeting with them and talking about it. That's a problem if you tell the FBI you're not doing it for a client, but you're billing a client for it. And that is the essence of what he is accused of, is that lie right there. Yeah. Uh, his defense that he's arguing is that it's immaterial to whether or not there were actual concerns going on. It doesn't matter if he said it was on behalf of a client. But the, the evidence the FBI has been able to get as far as like communications that the researchers that were working with him were talking about, it really looks bad. It looks like they were trying really hard to gin something up without a firm baseline to it. And that wastes a lot of time with the mm -hmm. FBI when somebody that's an attorney who's supposed to be a trusted professional buffer, somebody who is a gatekeeper for being able to figure out when material does need to go to the FBI. If they are not living up to that standard and they're bringing forward things that are maybe a little shaky and they know it, that's a problem. We can't waste the FBI's time with that type of thing and that's a crime. That's what he's being accused yeah. of doing. And you know, the crime itself was they believe that he uh, falsified the data. And this is my me layman speaking it, but that he falsified well, I, the data. I, I, don't, I don't think that's necessarily the crime that he's being yeah. accused of. He's being accused, accused of, of lying, lying to the yes. FBI yes. Uh, about who he was bringing okay. it forward with. Right. The the data underneath it. I don't think he's being accused necessarily directly, as far as the crime is concerned, of just making that up. But it's a, important because it leads into the other trials that might follow. So the, the you know the. The conspiracy, if it were a conspiracy involving at least four people or more, involved some sort of um, a, a falsification of the data that led everyone to the alpha server. Um, um, you know, belief that the alpha server was was connected between Trump Tower and uh, Alpha Bank, uh, the Russian bank. That's sort but of my understanding of it is a little more nuanced to that. Mm -hmm. I don't think that they're being accused of just making up the data. They they are in their interpretation of it. They're their view of it, their uh, conclusions they leapt to are the part that's kind of made up and not supported. But the actual underlying data itself that they're drawing from, that's, I don't, I haven't seen an allegation of that just being totally made up. I think there was a claim that it looked, someone had said that in their analysis, it was, uh, it looked like all the IP addresses were uh, human uh, derived from and not machine derived from. And I think that's the, you know, I mean, in other words, they were not the actual how you you're much more of an expert in this than, than i yeah. but that you know it was yeah, a, it, these were sort of made up or or placed but the, the, well having having something that looks like it could be could have been human generated you're you're risking going from another leap there because mm. the researchers themselves it doesn't it they don't aren't necessarily the ones that were making it up they can see that type of data and anybody could have made it up and intentionally sent that type of connection or data or 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 whatever got it entered into their obs their field of observation uh in a way that that looks like it may have been ginned up by somebody but that doesn't mean the researchers themselves necessarily were doing it uh and i haven't seen anybody accuse them directly of of doing it it does lead to that possibility mm -hmm. but the, it, there's a there's a broader problem here and that is that the data they drew this from they didn't they didn't follow the necessary standards like like in in law you have the the daubert standard which says that 
experts have to follow methodology that is uh, reasonable, accepted by a large amount of other fellow researchers in the field uh, and would lead to basically not not foolish uh, conclusions, right? They didn't do that in here. Mm -hmm. And it's it's really important to, to, I guess, to the cybersecurity side of things, to separate the idea of whether or not the data pool that you're pulling from is made up or fake, because you can spoof anything on the displays on a computer and get to the actual problem of they didn't treat it in a mature, well-founded, well-reasoned way to reach the conclusions that they were pushing forward. Mm -hmm. And that's a really important nuance we got to understand mm -hmm. here. That is a very important nuance. And this is just the first trial. There are going to be other trials. So this is a trial where Mr. Sussman is being accused of basically lying to the FBI. And also, um, there are some questions around uh, this data. Let's just leave it at that, that sort of, you know, not so, not so nuanced uh, statement. But um, the, the biggest sense of what's going on involves these three characters over here. So I, I've tried to strip this down to its bare minimum here because there are other characters, but I just want everyone to sort of understand the main thrust of the allegations here. So there's Mr. Sussman on the bottom left, accused of lying to the FBI at a September 16 meeting when he presented documents claiming to show secret internet communications between the Trump organization and Russia-based Alpha Bank. In the red there, you see um, some of the analysis that's being put out there. And it says there that Mr. Sussman falsely told the FBI he was uh, presenting this information solely as a good citizen, failing to disclose his ties to the Clinton campaign and he has pleaded not guilty to that, which we've discussed already. That's sort of the core of this particular crime. Now, the guy on the on the top right, I don't know if people have been paying a lot of attention to Mr. Mr. Joffe over here, because Rodney Joffe has probably done, you know, the bulk of the, the stuff here that you would go, whoa, you know, you'd raise your eyebrows about some of the things he was involved in, because uh, let's give you some background first. He's a South African born former IT guy with a top secret clearance. Uh, EOP, uh, that means the executive office, I think, of the president. Um, so he actually had the secret clearance all the way up, up to the president, up to the White House, uh, and meaning he could see all the data flowing from there to anywhere else. And, and you know, that would give you pretty high level security clearance, I suspect. Um, and he won the FBI Director's Award for Cyber Investigation. He's named one of four people in the Durham probe, um, and the others we've already mentioned, uh, Michael Sussman, but Mark Elias we'll talk about in a second. Um, so he has a history as well of running uh, consumer scams, which is kind of bizarre that he was able to get the security clearance he did. But what he did with that data is that, you know, in the top right here, you'll see that he, he was able to access the dedicated service for the executive office of the president as part of a sensitive arrangement whereby it provided internet services to the White House. Um, that, it says, you know, if we pause on that moment, that seems to me like an incredible breach of... Um, of, of, of access to something that even if you had the security clearance, you couldn't be freelancing with it on, on whatever project you were working on. And in this case, it was a freelance sort of project for Perkins Coie, the, the, the law firm. Yeah, yeah, that's that's very dangerous waters. That is not not something that is advisable. Yeah, if you are given that kind of trusted, privileged access to data that is not public or available to the public in any way, uh, you got to be extremely careful about what you do with it. And if, if it gets end up if it ends up being used for a, a partisan slanted type of thing, you're going to face all sorts of accusations. And we're talking about the Obama White House, right? At this point, we're talking about back then because this this whole thing was taking place in in 2016 when uh, Obama was still in the White House. So he was accessing the previous presidents of you know the president before Trump, uh, and that also seems like an unusual fit for this group of people when you when you finally consider who they who they who they are and who they might be acting for. So. Um, you know, that's, that's interesting. Now, Mr. Joffe's goal, according to one uh, part of these indictments, was to create an inference and narrative about Mr. Trump that would please certain VIPs. And he's referring to individuals at Perkins Coie and the Clinton campaign. That's according to the Wall Street Journal. Um, and, and finally, it says here that Mr. Mr. Joffe's team also was monitoring internet traffic related to Trump Tower and Mr. Trump's apartment on Central Park West. And so... You look at all that and you, you know, um, I know a lot of people don't want to believe this, but it looks like some people were spying on Donald Trump in the lead up to the 2016 elections. And I mean, this is proven to be true. These, this guy seems to have been doing that. I mean, that's just the, that's just the facts, I think. And it might be, it's, it's, but it's, it might be, it, it, it's important yeah. to realize that when you're looking at the entire ocean, mm. you're going to be able to pick out certain individual fish here and there simply because yeah. they exist in the ocean. He had access to the whole ocean of, of certain types of data. And yeah, that includes uh, uh, sensitive political figures. That's yeah. just the nature of large observation of uh, 
networked internet flow data. Except he was working alongside, you know, Mr. Sussman and Mr. Elias to also create all these, um, you know, this other uh, narrative, what are they called, inference and narrative um, that would, you know, suggest that Mr. Trump was somehow involved with the Russians. So uh, it's... Yeah, that, that's the, the step too far. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and <laughs> an analogous true. thing, like in the past, I've found entire nationwide voter databases. Mm -hmm. That includes things like celebrities, political figures. Uh, there was a time in the past and something that uh, I was reviewing, I, I looked up Oprah's, the last four digits of Oprah's social security number, just because I was curious if she was in there and it, she was there. You know, uh, oh, it, it's just sorry. a matter of I yeah. found everything. Yeah. So, yeah, there's going to be interesting people in it. Uh, if if I were to have then done something to, to Oprah or claim sort of, you know, political slant against her, that would have been a step too far. Yes. Uh, but just simply having access to the large pool of everybody includes the interesting fish within it. It does seem to me that this is where he got this information about the server being there. I mean, because he was he was tracking Trump Tower and that's where the supposed server was. And and I think it really was a server. It was just doing marketing material, according to the uh, FBI and, and Mueller, who landed up investigating it. But who knows if that's the case? But, you know, this that's how he would have found that that, that concerning server, presumably. I mean, we don't know if it's easy, you know that for sure, but that's a, an assumption one could make. Um, in well, if, if you have if you have privileged access to the uh, entire, you know, an entire archive of, of these connections that go across the internet backbone uh, through DNS lookups and all that, if you have access to observation of just the wide everything, like like he had access to through uh, these, these special partnerships um, and business connections, uh, uh, Trump Tower existed as a node on the internet, mm. just like every other business out there. So yeah, he would have access to, to see what was coming back and forth through there. But uh, using that wide swath of, of data that's available in trying to gin, intentionally trying to gin up something, and when there are messages prompting you to do that, that gets a little bit weird. Good quality investigations that follow the law, they don't start off by somebody saying, we need to find something that says this. Yeah. It starts off by somebody noticing something's not right, and if it happens to hook in somebody big name, then they get hooked in while you're looking into the wrongness. Right. Uh, but right. you don't start with a big name and say, we got to find something on them and then try to make a story fit. It doesn't work like that. Which is a great way to introduce Mark Elias because Mark Elias was the chief counsel to the Clinton campaign in 2016. He was a, he's a big lawyer for the Democrats in general, but also for all sorts of Clinton uh, um, functions, including the the, the the initiative i think the global initiative is under his his purview as well so he's a he's a top-notch lawyer you know if you remember the news in in 2020 mark elias was the guy fighting all those uh fraudulent claims that Sidney powell and rudy giuliani brought forward he was the guy who was you know defeating each of one of those and advertising it loudly every day on twitter so he he seems to be the sort of the top dog here i mean in terms of how the if there was a, a scheme of some sort, then he was the guy who would have put that scheme together. And, uh, and you know, and now the question is, did he know and did the Clinton campaign know that Mr. Sussman was going to the FBI and, um, and telling them about the story? And, and I don't know if there's a clear answer to that, but, um, you know, this is, this is still, you can, I, I think it looks to me like it's an ecosystem that's, that's within the, the surrounding area of the Clinton campaign. So it's not the Clinton campaign proper, but it's the kind of place that you'd want to, you'd be running your dirty tricks out of. You know, it's sort of adjacent, has some connectivity, but isn't directly um, attached to the Clinton campaign. And I think that's what they they might be driving at, uh, or Dara might be driving at. Um, and, you know, that's that's a big deal. If uh, if it was the Clinton campaign doing that, then that's going to be a, uh, a very, you know, that's the difficult pill for all of us to swallow. I mean, that's, I've, I've been staying here for five years now, you know, saying, you know, Trump, Russia, Trump, Russia, Trump, Russia. And yes, there was a lot of Trump, Russia. There's no doubt in my mind that Russia helped Donald Trump in, in 2016 and in 2020. But um, the idea that some of that information, and, and I reported on the Alpha server, like many others, um, was concocted and placed into the uh, zeitgeist and into the ecosystem um, by a dirty tricks operation. I mean, that's, that is a big story regardless. I mean, regardless of where your politics might lie, you want to take, pay attention to this. And you, and in my opinion, you also want to pay attention. If any presidential candidate is being spied on by anybody, it's not a good thing. Um, you know, we should try, uh, we should certainly understand how that happens and why that happens because it can be used in, in nefarious um, or malign campaigns like this.
Um, well, and yeah. I'm not sure it's fair to really say that this is evidence of spying upon. It's just that big data companies are out there. They're slurping up everyone's data. So mm. if you're going to say that this is spying upon someone in particular, everybody's being spied on like that. So it's across sure. the board. It's it's kind of the new reality and deals with privacy and internet activity in general. It's not, I don't think we've really proven up or, or have the, the ability to say a specific candidate was being spied on through this and only that scope down. It's, it's a bigger issue than that. I mean, people have said that it's not me just saying it. There are people who have said that this is evidence of that, but you know, we haven't, we haven't, the trial has just started. We don't even know what will happen. Um, so we can't say that for sure. You're absolutely right. But there, you know, there are sort of editorial boards who've concluded that this is sort of where this is leading to. And it wouldn't be out of the realm of, of, of a possibility because of course he was under investigation at the time as well. So all sorts of people could have been looking at his data, uh, both officially and unofficially, and who knows how could have, some of that could have gone out. So, um, you know, it is. And I'm not, I'm not saying it didn't happen. I'm saying it definitely happened. There's no yeah. question that it didn't yeah. happen because it's happening to everybody. That's yeah. what I'm saying is it is definitively proven. It's just the way it, it, it happens. We're all being spied on the same way as this. So I'm not, and I'm not at all saying it didn't happen. It's just that, this it kind of access that he has must be better than than your typical, you know, Verizon or access. Or do you think it's about the same? You you know this data better than anybody else. I mean, is this is it that easy to crack everybody's data and look at everyone's uh, details and, and secret life like this? Is that is that that easy? It depends on what level of uh, person you are. Uh, yeah, for, for the big companies that are the backbones of the internet, yes, they have all this data and yes, they're looking at this data and yeah. uh, whether or not they admit it. Yeah, it, it is. Companies are not are not very honest uh, about the broad, the, the, the depth of data that they are collecting and viewing and learning about everybody. Mm. It's but for the average person out on the street, uh, no, you have no you have no ability to, to view this stuff. There's, there's a lot. Of, it, it's kind of like the scale of earthquakes where you have like a one and a two and a three are very, very low. And by the time you get up to like a 7.0 earthquake, yeah. it's it's orders of magnitude more powerful. When you get somebody that really knows what they're doing, they've been in this for years and they work at a place that is one of the internet backbones. And uh, they, 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 the amount of data they have access to is just astronomical. It would blow your mind. Right. Can you take us back to 2015? And we'll come back to this stuff a little bit more, but I think what you, what you found out in 2015 was very relevant, what you were just, just talking about there, obviously. So can you just recap a little bit of the story that uh, that led you here and uh, and why it was so critical, what you discovered in 2015? Well, I believe what you're talking about in 2015 was uh, in December of 2015, I had started making a name for myself in finding data breaches on the internet, not causing them, but finding them, the ones that existed that were already out there that people didn't know existed, uh, especially the companies that were responsible for having caused them. And I would point out, hey, you are not protecting this in any way, shape or form and anybody on the internet can download it, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I was working at a law firm at the time and I was working in the tech department. And so I, I, I had started my career in paralegalism. I understood some of the boundaries on what I could and could not do legally. And that afforded me a lot of protections that uh, a lot of security researchers didn't know about and they would step in the wrong place and they would get sued or arrested for doing something unlawful and so uh, what i came across uh and was able to write about and express in a way that kept me safe was uh a collection of 191 million voter i, I wouldn't say registration records but more deep than that they were profiles they were all the stuff that you would expect a voter registration database to have in from each locale in the in, Entire United States, but enriched with survey data, enriched with uh, targeting data, enriched with a particular, uh, it was it was a religious 501c4 uh, that was behind it ultimately. And it was being used in a, in a very, uh, what I would say, unlawful way. Mm. And it caught on like wildfire in the news that, oh my God, everybody in the entire country, their data is here. If you're registered to vote, Vickery knows your phone number, your, your email address, your home address, he knows your political slants, all this stuff. And people started to wake up and realize there are companies and nonprofits and political entities that have this wide collection of data that if it was being sold to a commercial venture, it would be illegal. It would not be allowed. It would raise eyebrows and it would be a, a, a crime for somebody to be selling this type of data. Why can they just make it available to the public internet in a way that I could come across it without paying a penny? Mm. Uh, it, it, raised a lot of people's i it raised a lot of issues that people hadn't considered were issues at the time mm -hmm. 
And of course, I wasn't able to get anybody as far as law enforcement goes interested in it for a very long time. They kept telling me, oh, that's publicly accessible data. That's no big deal or whatever. Yeah. But if I'd come across the same thing this last year or or back in 2020, it, it would have been a five alarm fire. Right. The, the handling of voter data and the idea of it being openly accessible has changed. It's like night and day compared mm. to today versus 2015, 2016. Yeah, and that's because we, we were hacked. I mean, there's just no other way around it. We Something happened in 2016 that, and the release of this information is probably a key part of that, um, that, you know, made the electorate probably act in a way that it would not have acted otherwise. It's certainly not according to polls or other expectations. But, um, you know, whether it was the misinformation and disinformation, the targeted uh, profiles, whatever it was, that uh, that election was very different than any previous election. It was also very different because of what you, I think, also helped discover, which was that some of this data was being used into um, in religious uh, in, in churches around the country in order to sort of identify people who could become radicalized or or extreme, or, you know, could have the weaknesses. They're not weaknesses, but let's say the life challenges that might make them susceptible to becoming more extreme. Um, and what what, what yeah. United in Purpose was doing. Yeah was they were going to all the mega churches around the country and they were getting the pastors to give them their congregation roles and they would compare that role with who's registered to vote and they would figure out who's not registered and they would identify what they called a champion in that congregation who is somebody that believed in the biblical lifestyle who is anti-abortion who is pro-gun who is all the things that the MAGA crowd loves and they would get that champion to then target other members of the congregation in that mega church to register to vote and to go out and vote. And the champion could filter out the people who maybe were pro-choice, who maybe were not so pro-gun. And it was a way to politicize religion and corral the troops and try to uh, affect things in a very political way by using means that are, are by law not allowed to be political. Uh, mm -hmm. And they crossed a lot of lines in doing it. And you're going to cut to the abortion decision uh, by the Supreme Court or about to be maybe abortion decision by the Supreme Court and also to the people who showed up for January 6th. I mean, there's just a lot of uh, the same kinds of people who, who would have been scooped up in this data uh, that the churches were after, um, which would have been... Justice Thomas's wife, Jenny, is very much involved with United in Purpose, that group. Yes, there is a isn't that interesting connection. Yeah. I was wondering, as you know, we were talking earlier on about the, the Justice Department now wanting all these transcripts. I wonder if Ginny Thomas's transcripts will be amongst them because she really is a key figure in all of this. I mean, she sort of planned the, a large part, part of this. Uh, and it would be really bizarre if the wife of a Supreme Court justice was under investigation by the DOJ. May happen. I mean, I don't know if that's ever happened in the past before. I don't know if you'll know She's the been very vocal about it, yeah. 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 You know, there's a, actually, I should, uh, should, I, should I segue here to this? I might as well, because we sort of missed it earlier on. There's a interesting group of people that all must be a little bit scared today about what they might be coming down the pike for them, because these people are, you know, they're, they're sort of the respectable edge of the far right extreme world. The you know, NBA, yes. Yeah. There's, you know, the Lisa Nelson of Alec and there's um, Charlie Kirk and you know, Alexander, who we already know is, is, cooperating with authorities um ed martin of the judicial crisis network and and ed well freed maybe not so acceptable but uh you know the this is all these are all arms of of the council for national policy this is this is where all of this was coordinated and when you look at the january 6th committee now wanting to hand over these um, transcripts to the department of justice all these people are in some way or another attached to that event on January the 6th. They either, you know, arranged buses or spoke or funded in, in some way um, the events of January the 6th. This is not just your typical, you know, rank and file Republican. These are the biggest names in, in conservative politics and the biggest moneyed names in conservative politics. So, you know, I imagine there's some nervousness tonight among some of these people if there hasn't been already. And of course, Ginny Thomas is amongst the key people there um again i'm not going to ask you to comment on that unless you want to but it's uh it seems it seems like it's a, it's out of the it's out of your particular level of interest but let's go back to um sussman because here's the interesting thing about michael sussman's case is the scheme really wasn't just about going to the fbi and saying here's alpha bank information that might be wrong or that i don't disclose who my client is really what they were trying to do is sort of this three-step process they were trying to and this is from all the indictments when you look at them carefully. There's, they wanted to um, build the scenarios where they had evidence, 
maybe falsified, maybe real evidence, but they would build scenarios that they could then take to the FBI. They would try to get the FBI engaged. They'll try to get the government to investigate. And then once they had the government investigating, then they would use uh, their influences in the press and the media to say, hey, the government is investigating Donald Trump. So it was a, it was a three-stage process. And I think that's what people haven't quite seen yet is that there's this second piece of it, that it's not just getting the FBI to investigate. That's one thing that's and it's, you know, it's critical and important and we, we need to stop the FBI from doing all these it'd be way, time being wasted like, in the way that they were by, by Sussman, but or allegedly by Sussman. But this idea that then that would have going to be used as a way to, to amplify all of this into the media. Um, so, you, you know, it was their doing that got an investigation going and then it would be them who are pushing the news media to to amplify it. And I think that's a really significant difference. And it it also is a bit of an echo of, of 2016. I mean, um, it is, of course, 2016, but it's a, it, it reminds me of what they were doing with the amplification around uh, social media in 2016, where, you know, they're not, they'd not only be the amplifiers of the news, they'd be the creators of the news, and then they'd be, the, you know, ultimately they'd be the people who are distributing it. And the saddest part is they really didn't need to make something up. They didn't, they didn't, there was plenty of honest to God, scandalous stuff <laughs> that was real that they, if they'd have just, you know, done it the right way, they could have yeah. found all kinds of, you know, they could have hit the real veins yeah. of gold on there and found the real things that needed to be talked about. There was no need to gin things up. And that really is a, is a real shame. Yeah. That, uh, such a thing went down. It is, I mean, but it also speaks to the kind of, um, you know, it's a cynical side of politics. I'm sure this happens in, in, in various ways, but the fact that the FBI would be used as a tool of a political party or a political candidate who's running for president. Uh, and then, you know, in order to do this is kind of just, it's sad. It's a sad state of affairs for American politics. And it, it is certainly coming from, uh, even whether it's direct or indirect, coming from the Clinton camp, it's, it is disappointing, if true, um, you know, that, that uh, it did come from the Clinton camp because I like to think that, you know, the Republican Party, just because of everything we've seen in the last five years or four years, is, you know, is more corrupt than the other side, but maybe there's corruption on both sides and it's just completely normal that we have to accept that. And I think the, the really key thing to realize here is that it comes down to a question of did the, the Clinton campaign tell Sussman to lie to the FBI about working on this in connection with them? Because if they didn't say to him, hey, hey don't tell them that, that you're working on it in connection to to our campaign, then that's that's a, a big deal. If they expected him to admit to the FBI, hey, I'm working with the Clinton campaign on this, and uh, they are really interested in getting this looked into, and I vetted it, and I think it's worth bringing up to you, and hey, here have this package of information, that changes the scenario entirely, mm -hmm. depending on that question right there. So that's what I'm highlighting as so important to this trial, is the that one lie. Because the FBI has ways to assess politically related material. This is not the first time this has happened. Somebody has no. come to them in the past and said, hey, uh, there's this thing about my political opponent, no. uh, you know, and, and I'd like you to look into it. And they've got ways of, of evaluating that and weighing that and handling it appropriately. It's the lie about not representing or not working with any political client on it that is the sin here. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a cover-up, really. Otherwise, why would why would you not admit that? It seems like it's kind of an obvious thing to, if you weren't worried about it, why wouldn't why would you not admit it? It does raise a yeah. lot of questions about what was going on in the FBI in 2016, because, you know, they had a bunch of these things. They had the Comey event, they had the Wiener laptop, yeah, they was, had that was that was a, a shame. Yeah, her, her I mean, emails, her emails. Yeah. I mean, this is what they did in 2016. It seems like there's a lot of activity around, you know, investigating all these political candidates for doing all these things, or allegedly doing all these things, and. It's unusual in this case that they're going to have five FBI representatives on, or officials uh, testifying on both on, on, on either side here. On, so five for the defense and five for the prosecution. Um, and that is, means that in some ways the FBI is going on trial um, in, the, in the next two weeks because the decisions made, um, even though they arrived at the right decision, they obviously investigated this and decided not to do it. I think that there's a lot of questions around how far it got and about how it plays into some of the other investigations that took place um, and and just what exactly was going on in 2016 because the election was were definitely impacted by uh, the FBI uh, in 2016 and we should not have a situation like that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Protocol was not followed. Uh, and the idea of even just having FBI testifying for, or, you know, for the defense and for the prosecution that, that idea in itself, that blows my mind. Mm. You know, they're supposed to circle the wagons and 
have a, a unified front on what their stance is. Yeah. The idea of having FBI agents that in a public trial are disagreeing with each other potentially. Yeah, it's going to be weird. That, that's that's really, really something special. That's not normal. Yeah, I mean, they normally appear for the prosecution because that's where normally their work is. So this is an unusual thing that there's, you know, there's been a long, long history of the FBI allegations of, of the FBI being compromised in some way or another. That's not that's not new and it's almost expected. Uh, but the fact that they're, you know, um, arriving at this one trial together and we're seeing this conflict in, on two different sides. I think it's going to be really interesting to see how it, how it falls out and how many, you know, what it, what we learn, what we can learn about the, how um, the FBI really operates because it does operate in these in this kind of fractured way where you could have an investigation against one president or presidential candidate on one side and another presidential candidate on the other side. And you may not even know that there's uh, there are two investigations against uh, these two candidates. So that's uh and, i think it's gonna be interesting it's totally possible to follow all the protocols and some little department has access to information that another one doesn't have and that little piece of information can totally change your understanding of a scenario so it is plausible that it could happen but yeah you're right seeing it play out here is going to be very very interesting and of course the, what, what the other big concern here is the fisa warrant that they were able to get on carter page which again had some sort of i, I think something was falsified in in the, in the fisa application including i think the fact that this guy that carter page was basically a cia individual or asset of some sort and that um you know they should have deconflicted that and realized that they were they were about to spy on a cia asset and they didn't do there that was, there was an attorney uh, or agent or something or other that mm. yeah fudged something in an email that he shouldn't have and he's yeah. admitted wrongdoing there and uh yeah that that type of thing should should not happen uh yeah, and yeah, that's that's that Kevin Klein Smith. The... Carter Page, he he had done enough stuff that, on the outside, yeah, it looks like definitely FISA territory. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and if you don't follow all the rules to a T, you run into problems. And yeah. when there's not sufficient oversight, such as with FISA court, it leads to all sorts of uh, problems. And generally speaking, checking with the CIA should be kind of high up on your list. I probably because they are the people who'd be engaged in this kind of stuff. Um, well, it, you know. it becomes one of those things that you don't want to be able to have any interaction there unless it's absolutely necessary. Right. Because from a cybersecurity perspective, the, the whole idea of like a SQL injection attack is you send uh, strings of input that give you a certain output depending on what's inside the database. Mm. So if I'm even allowed to send a query to the CIA, I can gauge the responses back from them and I can learn various things about what the truth may be, depending on how they answer it, how quickly they answer it, what they say, who they point me towards afterwards. So not allowing any communication there is optimal because they're a secret agency. We yeah. don't we don't want a lot of things there. But but yeah, it is one of those things that you got to be very, very careful about. Do you think that the communications around presidential candidates or politicians in general are secure enough? Or do you think that we're still in a, in a wild west over here where people can just basically access yeah, they're, everything? They're, they're, they are not secure enough. People are not using the amount of, of uh, secured communications uh, as they should. And the the worst part is that I'm not sure the necessary technology and software is available mm. to the general public that is necessary to do the types of communications they do in a secure way. Uh, every app is basically spyware. The mm. companies, uh, they, they want to make money. So they include things uh, that are, are commonly referred to as SDKs in their piece of software or their app or whatever, that is a nice way of saying a poison pill. Every app you download, they're selling you out. That's the way the, the app economy has worked out. They're giving away your location data. They're giving away the, the keywords that you type and the metadata about everybody you're connecting to, your contact list, what's on your, your, your uh, copy paste board on your phone and everything. Uh, it's it's really a wild west, and I'm not sure there is a good way to advise people to to do it. And when you have a political campaign where there's so much on the line, it's it adds an element of people are much more willing to take advantage of those things. Whereas when it's just a normal consumer thing and just you know Joe Schmo on the street, maybe you you aren't going to spy on his communications in the same way because if you get caught, there's huge there's huge uh, repercussions. Mm. But if there's a politician a campaign for like presidency of the united states that changes the game because the risk to reward ratio tilts in the other direction all of a sudden yeah 
Of course, the foreign governments alone have such an, have, will have such a big uh, budget for these kinds of things relative to you know the average individual that it's uh, they they really are incentivized to 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 do this kind of stuff, and it doesn't just yeah, require. Like uh, Lindsey yeah. Graham's cell phone, I guarantee <laughs> there was a Pegasus infection on there. He is number one on the list of people you want to install Pegasus on their phone of. He uh, is like right up there. You know, yeah, because a lot of the time the more, the more compromisable people make for better candidates for these guys because they know they, comp they can compromise them later on. So they know they'll stick to the, you know, they'll stick to the rules or, or whatever instructions they get. Um, you yeah, know, and it's there's 15 other nations course. that are also hacking them, so you have plausible deniability. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, you know, I, I should remind everyone, we've got a few minutes left here, that on uh, narrative.org forward slash TV, narrative.org forward slash TV, our patrons, and only our patrons, can ask questions of, of, of me and Chris. And on YouTube, you can ask us questions that's anybody can can ask us questions there for the people who get on to narrative.org forward slash tv which i forgot to advertise earlier you can um, ask whatever questions you have of of chris and i or i'll just keep up talking here a little bit um what about the average person so i'm sure you get asked this a lot you know other than the than the obvious steps that you would suggest you know which was change your passwords i think last time and i don't know whatever it was you can remind me is there anything new on the on the horizons that people should be really um, doing at home to make sure that their data is secure? Well, changing your password often is not something that is, is recommended anymore. Oh, really? Multi-factor authentication is what is recommended. Right. Have a secure password and use it, but also have a secondary authentication layer. That's those like one-time codes you get texted to your phone or through like the Google Authenticator app. Yeah. Use those because right. if somebody gets your password that you know by heart and is really secure and is a pass phrase of multiple words, they can try to log in but then you'll get that secondary uh, notification of somebody trying to log in. Here's the code that you need. And you'll know that somebody you know, has figured out your password or whatever. So having a long, strong password that you know combined with multi-factor is vitally important these days. That's really the, the best advice. Changing a password every 30 days, 90 days, all it does is make people forget their password. Yeah. Oh, I hate that. You know, so it's amazing how often I forget my password. And then even worse, when I forget my phone and my password, because I don't know where I left my phone, trying to get the authentication, you know, authenticated, it's it's kind of hard to do. Um, but that's just because I'm a Luddite, I guess. Um, I, I'm, do you think things are better, think people are safer, ultimately? Do you think we are safer than we were in 2016? Do you think the voting infrastructure is safer than we were in 2016? I... I think, thing, the, I think the landscape has changed. I am very vocal in my opinion that we should not have computers involved in, in voting. Uh, I, I think that just like we were talking about a few minutes ago with the risk versus reward, I'm a cybersecurity guy. I love computers. I spend all day every day on a computer, but voting the reward to uh, screwing with, with voting tabulation the, the, even even at a small targeted level the reward is so very high mm -hmm. that it is worth the risk to a lot of people and it throws everything out of whack voting machines are only brought out of storage every you know every year or two or when 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 they're necessary they're not maintained and updated the way that a secure computer needs to be maintained and updated there's a lot of interaction that is is niche to that category of device it just it doesn't add up to a secure, reliable thing that we should be trusting to determine without any sort of paper trail who the president is. I'm all for hand marked paper ballots counted by hand. It was good enough to elect Eisenhower, Abraham Lincoln, all the greats. We can do it again. It's 100%. not going to take too long. We can do it again. And there was talk about doing that. I mean, I think for 2020, there was talk about doing that, and then it sort of disappeared. They, they, it got, all, no, got it, pretty it, high. It did, it did happen in, yeah. in some places. If you remember, yeah. there were months and months where we didn't have the final tally because they were forced, whether it be through lawsuits or just out of, out of uh, caution, they were counting things by hand. And it didn't take forever. And we survived, and we have a president out of it. Yes. So it is possible. It is yeah. not an impossible barrier to overcome. Do you think the 2020 election was as secure as Chris Krebs likes to tell us that it was? I think it was it was acceptably secure. I don't I don't think it it I don't think we have a way to measure whether or not it was the most secure election in US history. I do, you know that's that seems like a little bit of uh, marketing speak yeah. for me. Just and I'm not saying it wasn't. I'm just saying I don't think we have any way of knowing if it was. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. I, 
I tend to, to be on the side of things that if, if one person can affect a computer remotely that, that has a number built into it digitally that it's counted up, that's a lot easier to happen than having one person go out and affect a whole group of, of hand counting people in each uh, locale or county or precinct. It's a lot harder to screw up an election as an individual if everybody's counting by hand. And yeah. a, an indiv a really smart individual that knows what they're doing and can get into things, uh, not, you know, not even to speak of like a nation state hacking group that really knows what they're doing, but the ability for one single remote person to affect a system that, that causes doubt on the an entire election, it's not worth the risk. We need to count these ballots by hand and mark them by hand. The challenge there becomes, you know, these new secretaries of state that are being elected in different parts of the country that are basically QAnon adherents and even a potentially a governor in Pennsylvania. I mean, we're talking about people who are, you know, who are, <laughs> already don't believe the 2020 elections and think that that was stolen. So, you know, what, what are they going to do in the chief counting position in some of these states? And, you know, that, that whatever they do, it's a lot. It's a lot easier for them to do it with an electronic system. Right, right, right. If you have a whole bunch of, of groups of counting people and each one has at least one or two people from each registered political party that are agreeing on what the ballots say and the number that are there. One secretary of state is not going to be able to affect all of those groups of people that are counting these things by hand, but they can have a server in a room that they put one guy on and, and screw with. And even if they don't change anything, it causes a, a possibility of doubt in the minds of the voters. And that's what matters is the the integrity of the election. Uh, yeah, it, it, yeah we, we need to count them by hand. We're no, that's not going to happen, though. Obviously, in the next in the next round, or maybe the next couple of rounds. So, um, you know, we'll. But I think there's enough uh, enough people paying attention to all the stuff that hopefully we'll be able to figure out uh, where the where the swings are being unreasonable. But who knows? It could be a very tight election, especially this year. I think the uh, you know the the way the polling is breaking out. Although I can't believe it, considering all the news that's that's happening. I mean, it seems like a fertile ground for the Democrats to do really well. But uh, it still seems like the Republicans have a little bit of an edge. In, in, in the final tally in the house. Um, I want to just before we leave, if, if you don't mind, uh, tell people about something we're going to be doing here on uh, narrative um, come June, because there are eight hearings happening in the January the 6th hearings, and we're going to cover all eight hearings, gavel to gavel, plus exclusive analysis and direct access to the team who are uh, giving you that analysis. And we'll be doing that only for patrons. It's an unashamed attempt to raise more money for narrative because we really do need more funding. And the way we get all our funding or most of our funding from is from patrons. And that allows us to do independent news the way other people simply cannot do independent news and have conversations like we've just had where, you know, if you turn on your corporate news media tonight, you're likely not going to see too much coverage of Michael Sussman's case, um, or certainly on the one part, one part of the spectrum there. So um, we encourage you to join up for Patreon at, for narrative on Patreon, that's patreon.com forward slash narrative, and you'll get all eight hearings, gavel to gavel coverage, plus exclusive analysis and direct access to your, the team throughout all those hearings in June. And I've got a really handy chart that I'm gonna be uh, printing out for everybody, showing all the players in, in January the 6th, and it's quite, it's quite a, it's quite a collection of faces. It's like a bingo board. So um, as people are discussing that on the eight hearings, we'll be able to uh, support, we'll be able to make, knock, I don't know, tick them off or something, I don't know. Maybe just admire them, uh, so, and uh, and we'll see how that happens. So that's all happening. Uh, the official announcement will be on uh, Patreon tomorrow. So check it out, and uh, hopefully you'll sign up. That's what I have for us tonight. Any other thoughts from you, um, Chris? Anything else you want to talk about or promote? Uh, feel free to. No, I, I think I think just the the nutshell message of of this entire broadcast should be be very careful about hearing about the the sussman trial there's a lot more nuance to it we need to separate the politics from the law uh and and peel that all out because it's, it's a huge knot and if people get involved in the politics and the tribalism they're not going to understand what the charges are and it's going to get screwed all over the place so just yeah. be very very careful about listening to what you hear about that i think it's very true and i also think that you know we have to remind ourselves that the important thing is that we have any you know fair elections and that people are not misusing the fbi's time. I mean, the FBI has got lots of things to investigate. There's, this is not an opportunity for political parties to be stepping in there or political players to be stepping in there and using up their time and resources to uh, conduct investigations. I mean, that really is the the real takeaway for me so far. Like, I have not yet uh, seen enough evidence to suggest that it goes much bigger or broader than that. I think it's just that. Um, and so, uh, 
you know, hopefully that's the way that's the way it stands. But it isn't. It's not a case that's worthy of ignoring. And I think there is a tendency amongst the left to not take a look at this case because they're scared of what it might imply. And I don't think it's that scary. I think it's okay to look at this case and say, yeah, there's some players here that may have may have crossed the line. Let's figure out what those lines are and let's make sure that no one crosses them again. But let's not commit the same offenses that the right does, and you know, and not cover the news because the news is important and this is still very much the news. And that'll be the show for tonight. Uh, Chris Vickery, how can people find you on Twitter? Uh, Vickery Sec is my my Twitter handle, but if you uh, Google Chris Vickery Twitter, it'll be the thing that shows up. So easy way to find it. Awesome. Thank you very much for being here. It's been great having you on the show, and we look forward to having you again soon. I don't know what happened to Eric Garland, but he's – actually, I do know what happened to Eric Garland, but he's a little delayed. He's on the road, so he couldn't uh, make tonight, but he hopefully will be with us tomorrow night. Uh, so we look forward to having him on the show. And that's all we have for you on Narrative tonight. We'll see you again tomorrow night. Uh, I'm not sure it's on the show tomorrow, but it will be – Splendid, I'm sure. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. COVID corruption and a coup to a war in Ukraine. At Narrative, we've been telling you the truth about Putin and Xi since 2016. Narrative, it's where truth lives.